Well, it's been an amusing over the last few days to watch clergy social media. Yes, there is such a thing. All the agonising over what to do with Mother's Day. I hope we are all grateful for our mothers today. I hope we will celebrate them. I hope we'll encourage them in their mothering. But of course, it's really Mothering Sunday, the day when we remember the church which gave us spiritual birth. And we remember those people within the church who nurture us like a mother. That's that language that Paul uses for his pastoral ministry. It's language that God uses for himself. Uh, it's how God cares for us. Now, of course, we all as, as Christians then have natural mothers and we have spiritual mothers. And some of us will do both jobs at various points and in various ways. Unfortunately, our passage this morning speaks to both the church nurturing and uh, the way we can then nurture one another uh, as mother uh, as mothers as well it may not be obvious how to begin with but it will become apparent i hope as as you bear with me over the next few minutes whilst we set the scene first then, let's pray shall we thank you heavenly father for your word of truth uh, a word that reveals jesus as the supreme example of what it is to uh, not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Please would you help us to desire that our church and our families uh, would be modelled on the servant leadership of Jesus. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. Well, in this first and the longest part of our sermon this morning, we're going to look at an example of how not to care for others. We'll come back to look more closely at Jesus later as a contrast and we'll see that he is more beautiful by the contrast. So I do ask that you bear with me. Uh, this part of the sermon is likely to be more distressing than the rest. Uh, we're going to look at the Pharisees, the religious leaders, and what they call the mob. So verse 49. No, but this mob that knows nothing of the law, there is a curse on them. These are the words of the most senior mother figures in Israel, speaking of their spiritual children. Their words are cruel and dismissive. Here are the people faithfully coming up to the temple to worship God at the Feast of Tabernacles, and the leaders who should be teaching and leading them pronounce a curse on them. To get how offensive this is, I want you to imagine a mother, perhaps your own mother, perhaps you as a mother, saying this. My kids are so stupid, I wish they would go to hell. It is shockingly offensive, isn't it? If her children are, are lost or confused or struggling to understand something, a mother should hug them and patiently and gently walk alongside them, protecting them from hurting themselves whilst they grow up to maturity. Much worse, I think, than this attitude, though, is the way that the Pharisees use their power to hide the truth from the people. When I first wrote this sermon, it's a complete rewrite now, I wanted to show the way that this behaviour of the Pharisees is really illustrative of all abuses in leadership. And I still think it is, but I don't think we have time to really wrestle with both of those things. So I want to focus this time on a very specific abuse, the way they hide truth from the people. Hopefully, we're still going to see that Jesus is, is a wonderful contrast to these people. But I hope we'll also come to appreciate the value of truth and to be truth people. We're going to ask, what sort of kingdom do we want to be part of? What sort of mother and father figures does our church want to have? Here's what John wants us to see. The religious leaders feel threatened by Jesus. We're going to see them see both their aim of silencing Jesus' voice and the way that they use their power to do that. This is, I think, about cancel culture. It is very contemporary. Jesus has already revealed that they don't have the love of God in their hearts, chapter 5, verse 42, that they don't obey God either, chapter 7, verse 19. He says that he is revealing their evil hearts, verse seven what they do love is the praise of the people 
Jesus is exposing their self-love that, and, and, and they hate him for it. Uh, Jesus comes as a better teach than them and the crowds begin to follow him and the authorities are losing their control over this crowd of people and so they're, they're losing the praises of the people that they love so much. So they seek to arrest him. Verse 32, they want to shut him up, to shut him away from the people. They want to cancel his voice, don't they? We'll pick the story up again in verse 45. We'll come back to the intervening verses shortly. Uh, where the temple guards who were sent to arrest him come back empty-handed. Why? No one ever spoke the way this man does, they say. Now that doesn't mean they're following Jesus. Only that they want to give Jesus a fair hearing. What do the leaders do? They cancel the conversation. They can't even allow people to talk about Jesus, much less listen to him. Um, and please notice how they stop the conversation. They belittle and they demean. Verse 47, you mean he's deceived you also? They offer themselves as a contrast, as if to, to point out that the temple guards, who are priests themselves, are nevertheless not qualified to judge what is worth listening to. Verse 48, have any of the rulers or the Pharisees believed in him? None of us believe in Jesus, they say. You can trust us and you shouldn't listen to him either. Oh, hang on a minute, though. What, what about Nicodemus? Uh, John is almost laughing. You can sort of see the irony as he deliberately draws our attention to the fact that he was one of their own number. Now, Nicodemus doesn't yet say that Jesus is right either. He just asks for Jesus to get a fair hearing, much like the guards do, verse 51. But the whole point is that the leaders don't want to listen to Jesus' words. His words are the truth, and they threaten to tear down their whole self-centred way of life. So again, the leaders are disparaging. Are you from Galilee too? Nicodemus is one of them, but as soon as he steps out of line, he gets cancelled as well. You must be a fool, blinded by your commitment to Galileans, not to see that Jesus isn't worth paying attention to. He gets cancelled. And what's really devastating here is this. Not only do they refuse to listen to Jesus themselves, but they use their cultural authority, their, their power, to silence others so that nobody listens to the words of Jesus. And it's horrible, isn't it? And that is how cancel culture works. It doesn't matter if your words are true. If they are a threat to the system, they must be crushed. And that is the context of verse 49. They despise the crowd, the, the mob as they call them, as uneducated and foolish for listening to Jesus. What little voice they had has been cancelled too. Last week, uh, Amazon, uh, the biggest book distributor in the world and almost a monopoly in this country, uh, pulled a book from its online sites. Many other bookshops immediately followed. In, in just a couple of days, you couldn't pick up this book anywhere. Uh, the book is called When Harry Became Sally. And if you've got my copy, I'd love to get it back at some point. I did, lent it to somebody, I can't remember who's got it. Uh, it's by the Catholic social commentator Ryan Anderson. Now, why was Anderson's book pulled? Because it told the truth. It marshalled scientific study and, and sociological analysis and pulled together those, those studies to help us to understand the transgender movement. And the trans lobby hate the book. Why? Because the worldview they're pushing is built on lies. Let me just give you two of the lies that are regularly told to parents. And the reason I'm pausing here is that I really want us to understand the way that the lies do real damage to people. If we're concerned with people flourishing, being um, the most fully human versions of themselves, then it really matters that we are committed to the truth. So imagine you're a child, who, a parent whose child is feeling uncomfortable in their body. 
And those of us who are older will know that that's a perfectly normal experience when you're going through puberty. And many of us would have felt it. That sort of dislocation as our bodies change. The child decides, perhaps because of social pressures, that they must be in the wrong body. And the parent, unsure what to do, takes their child to see a, a, a psychiatrist who tells them a couple of things. The first thing they tell you is your child is trans. And secondly, they tell you that if you do not pursue gender reassignment, your child will commit suicide. I'm not exaggerating. Many, many people have been told these very things. And of course, no parent wants that to happen to their children. So they, they're manipulated. Their emotional commitment to their children is manipulated by lies into putting their child through hormone therapies and surgeries that are irreversible and devastating to our bodies. But please notice the science. These are things that you can read in Ryan Anderson's book if you can get hold of a copy. Every study that's been done shows that the vast majority of kids, given time, uh, will reconcile themselves to their bodies and live normal lives. Many of us will have done that. They're, they're not trans, they're just teens struggling with the development of their bodies. If we give them the space and the support, they'll grow up to be normal people. And even for those who genuinely have gender dysphoria, the science really isn't supportive of surgery either. Even in the most trans-friendly societies in the world, the suicide rate, I'm sorry to say, for trans people after surgery is just as high as for those who don't have the surgery. These horrific painful therapies and surgeries don't do any good at all. They certainly don't reduce the chance of your child committing suicide. Our parents are being manipulated by lies to, to be part of a, a trans movement that is founded on lies. In other words, I would argue that the trans movement does at most harm precisely to the people that it pretends to help by lying to the parents and the children about what the child needs. And, and, I, and I rejoice in the, the Kirabel High Court case that was recently had, that, that basically argued for that very thing, and the courts agreed. Lying to children about what's really wrong with them and taking them through a process that gets them to surgery that, that can't really change who they are, but you tell them that it can, is just another lie that does damage to our society. Please hear, I have so much compassion for people who struggle in this area. I really do. But what I want us to see is this. Powerful people, people with a big voice in society, are using their voices to silence the truth because the truth threatens the world they're trying to build. Ryan Anderson's book shouldn't be a threat. It should get us engaging with the truth. But you can't buy it on Amazon now. You can still buy Mein Kampf and the, the, the Marxist... Uh, manifesto, communist manifesto, uh, both of which have sat behind the, the, the killing of millions of people in the last century or so. You can still buy those, but you can't buy uh, Ryan Anderson's book When Harry Became Sally because he's been silenced. And I want us to see that when we make our life decisions on the basis of lies, it necessarily works against human flourishing. And so it is in our passage this morning. The religious leaders are using their power to silence the voice of Jesus in the name of truth and goodness, just like it happens in our society today. And when we come back, we're going to think about how Jesus responds to this.